we're, we're very fortunate to have uh, Stanley Kahn, who is visiting us from Ripsaw. Uh, he is had a great career both in academia and in, um, in, in practice. He has been um, at Smith Breeden in a very senior position. He has worked at some of the best universities in the world. And now he has, with his son, started a new company called Ripsaw that aims to help individuals better manage their portfolio. So uh, let's welcome uh, Professor uh, Khan and look forward, we look forward to hearing what he has to say. If you have questions, you can type them in the chat or you can raise your hand when he takes a break to ask them that, okay? So uh, let's get started. And by the way, this is being recorded, obviously. Thanks, Kathleen. But as Kathleen said, I did do 25 years as a professor of finance and mostly teaching investment management. And although I was a tenured full professor and some of my colleagues thought I was going to the dark side, uh, that's a reference to uh, Star Wars. Uh, when I left in order to uh, take an offer I couldn't refuse, which was to be a principal director of research, shortly thereafter, co-director of the investment management group an institutional investment firm. By institution, we mean our clients are pension funds, both public and private, manage money for them, as well as central banks, commercial banks, and retail banks, but not retail investors, except for some time we ran a few uh, mutual funds as well as side, the side project. Um, Wonderful life, uh, it's very productive. I enjoyed it immensely. But when I turned 65, um, I said, you know, I could keep working or I could uh, take this idea of retirement with me uh, while I was still healthy enough to do the things I like to do outdoors which is uh, skiing, hiking, and backpacking. And I started out you know, doing quite a bit of that on the Appalachian Trail on the East Coast and uh, out here in Colorado. So it took a few years, but we eventually moved to Colorado and uh, got to build our dream house on the top of a mountain, it's in a pretty secluded area, but near ski resorts, very important. Uh, so I could just walk out the door and go hiking. And as you get older, it's good to be on the top of the mountains, so you don't have to do a lot of vertical to have the great views. Well, all was going well. My, my children, I have three of them in their 30s, uh, were having uh, children. So I was getting all these grandchildren, I have seven of them now. So that's great, a lot of fun. Someday you'll, you'll, you'll understand that as you age. Uh, but, uh, and I still kept uh, up as the editor of the Journal of Fixed Income to keep my mind going. And then one day, my daughter, the doctor, uh, her husband's a uh, attorney, and she came to me and said, Dad, uh, you know, I've got these uh, 403B retirement accounts at the University of Virginia. I've got some money in them. And so how should I invest? And I said, OK. And in my usual way that they're used to from the, our dinner table discussions, I started lecturing on strategic asset allocation, tactical strategies, taxes, liquidity, credit risk, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And it didn't take too long before my daughter said, stop, dad, just tell me what to do. Better yet, please do it for me. So I said, I can do that, but then what's going to happen when I'm gone? And as an educator, uh, I have strong beliefs in them being independent. And it's not that they didn't know a lot, because they had a lot of dinners with me over the years, okay? A lot of conversation. But this stuff gets a little bit more subtle and tricky and it needs attention. So I said, let me 
get a handle on this. Uh, you have a few accounts. Uh, Jeff, your husband has a few accounts. Uh, let's put them together. I'm going to create a spreadsheet, which I did, with all the accounts, all the individual securities in them. And then I, I also looked at what were the available investments within each plan, as well as they had a brokerage account where they could do whatever they like. And I said, well, you know, there's a lot of risk dimensions in portfolio management. There's a lot of moving parts going on. So what I did was I created columns in a spreadsheet of different, all the different risk dimensions and a total of 56 of them. So for each security, I had to put in uh, representations for that. So I spent a lot of time Googling around and getting information and copying and pasting. But when it was all said and done, the nice part was each column I could aggregate into a dashboard that had their total net portfolio exposures to all these 56 risk dimensions. And then we worked on what's an appropriate strategic asset allocation or benchmark strategy with no special information of where you'd like to be, where you should be. Here's the discipline we need. And then we can compare the risk dimensions between your portfolio and the benchmark. And I can copy that spreadsheet into another sheet and start adding more rows and consider additional investments and start changing the amounts invested in each till we got closer to the benchmark. That was the objective. And we'd meet every few months and go over where we were and where we wanna to get to and what kind of trades do you need to make in your accounts to get there? All fine, okay? But I haven't created any independence for them. And I also knew that whatever happened, it could not be as time consuming as I was spending on it for them. Okay, so gee, we need some automation here, but I didn't know what was available. So what I'm gonna talk to you about, I'm talking to you about innovation and disruption in the wealth management industry but I'm not gonna just talk about it. I'm gonna show you a solution. And this solution is kind of only available, has been only really available in the last five years or so in terms of having the technology to do it. Fortunately, my two sons, one was a chief data officer at a large institution and the other was a software engineer and a consulting firm. So they took a look and said, Dad, you know, we can automate this. Now, I didn't know how to do it and all the detail, even though I had done a lot in supervising a technology at uh, Smith Breeden, the firm I was at as director of research. But I didn't know the nitty gritty details anymore, but they did. So what evolved from it, after all the discussion, I said, I got to write some of these things down. And if it's going to be useful to them, it's going to be useful for others. And the spreadsheet technology I developed, um, many of uh, my family members, extended family and close friends also asked me advice. When they see a retired guy, they figure they have a lot of time. Okay? So, um, so I started doing that for all of them for free, but to just be able to figure out what was going on out there and to help them and save them a lot of money in fees and expenses and also give them better portfolio strategies which will perform uh, over their lifetime and easy ways for them to keep up with it. So my goal was to provide both the concepts in the form of a book and a web application that would be so automated that they could concentrate on the decision-making and not the labor-intensive activities I was doing in the spreadsheet. So here's a statement I'm gonna make. I have it in the book and I used it in podcasts and in articles and elsewhere that gets, 
investment advisors a bit upset. Okay. So my value proposition is given the potential conflicts of interest that exists between advisors and their clients, the managerial risk of their decisions and the excessive fees they charge, it's not too difficult to do better for yourself than what most professionals can do for you. You can see why that statement would bother advisors. Okay? I also make another statement that's not here. Uh, it's in the book, but people worry or get maybe a little upset about is, I've never met an investment advisor I could recommend to friends and family. It's also a strong statement because I find most of them are really salespeople that get marching orders from another department on what strategies to offer, what buckets to put people in so that they can use their economies of scale and their um, monopoly power over individuals for data and analysis. But even if you wanna pay a professional, and I can understand people that are so busy and have so much money, whatever, they it's still their responsibility to monitor their managers with questions concerning suitable strategies and performance. So they need a tool like we're gonna provide. Now, let me emphasize, because okay, I know you have a class of, where you're dealing with a lot of regulatory issues. And the beauty here for us as a business and some of my friends in in the, in the institutional advisory business uh, seem to uh, be jealous of is since we're only providing tools, we're not registered investment advisors, we don't have the same regulatory scrutiny. And we don't need it because again, it's not just that we're providing tools, it's up to the individual to make the decisions. Okay? And let me explain why I consider this time a perfect storm for a new paradigm in wealth management. The first really important thing that got me aggravated and excited <laughs> to embark on this process was when I looked at portfolios that some of my uh, close friends had and some of my family members had, I, the first thing I got upset about was, gee, we're in a low interest rate environment. So what are you earning on a money market fund today? Zero. The short-term T-bill rate is 0.04%. And the expense ratio on these funds are 0.11%, 0.16%. So the expenses already exceed the yield on the investments in that very short term, very low risk strategy. But yet you may be paying an advisor another one, one and a half percent of assets under management, which include the money market funds they have you in and all the bond funds that they have you in, the yield on bond funds today, the whole market, treasuries, mortgages, corporates together in this huge, representative portfolio of the whole market only earns 1.6%. If you use active managers plus an advisory fee, it's higher than that. So if you have fiduciary responsibilities, I don't understand how an advisor can look a client in the eye and tell them, yeah, well, you know, all your expenses exceed what you can get from the marketplace in terms of yield. And that's just promised yield. Expected yield is actually lower when you include default risk and prepayment risk. So advisor fees and expense ratios are a huge drag on wealth accumulation. But remember this fee structure was started decades ago. In the 1980s, uh, I recall having my first home, if I would have, had to use uh, a market mortgage rate, it was 
Treasury rates were above 10. Expected return on the stock market was over 20%. So if you paid 1% for a fee, people didn't get excited. I'm getting all this service. Great. It was still bad. You just didn't know it. Okay. But this low interest rate environment has revealed the fact that the fee structure is too high for today's environment. Now, where's the competition coming from? It's coming from what we call robo-advisors. We're also using computerized cookie cutter strategies for individuals. They can put them in a risk dimension bucket and put a lot of people in the same portfolio. So it's great for the economies of scale of the firm, but not necessarily great. It's not really individually tailored. Okay. So, you know, they can offer 40, 50, 60 basis points of assets under management in order to get those clients. And they're mostly younger. Okay. Uh, younger folks are more skeptical about advisors in today's world, which is there's something very good about it. Um, and they like technology. So, yeah, these robo advisors sound good. Okay. But remember, their portfolio strategy is really opaque to you. You, don't, you can't see through it. You don't know what they're doing. You can't model it. Okay? And the unnecessary complexity and opaqueness of portfolio composition is in all these advisor portfolios. Okay? And is all you have to do is look at a statement. I've got a statement example in my book of a, maybe the largest retail advisors in, in the world. And there's no information on expense ratios. There's very little detail. They don't want you to know too much. They want to say, this is complicated, so you need me. Okay. But finally, the nail in the coffin is that the performance of active managers is very poor. Over 90% of them out there underperform their benchmarks, when you, especially when you include the fees they charge. Gee, how do these people stay in business? Um, and over the years, people are realizing it and they're doing more themselves or even within um, certain advisors will use index funds, which replicate a segment of the market in the stock and bond market. So there's no managerial risk, okay? You're getting exactly what is intended at a much lower cost. And finally, in this last year, there's actually more assets invested in passive index strategies than active strategies, okay? All right, so that's the environment we're in, but something new to me has arisen over the last number of years. And that's technology. First, let me start with cloud technology. And I'm gonna go back a number of years because this isn't my first venture. Um, when I was at the University of Michigan, I went there in 1982. And in 82, the first IBM personal computer came out. And in 83, I got a grant from Dow Jones and for four IBM XT computers to create the first lab in the business school to be used solely for my investment management course. And they set me up with some uh, programs where I could download data, but I wrote the code in order to um, create efficient frontier mathematics. And I would give I divide the class into groups of four and give them a set of investment objectives and tell them you have $100 million you're managing and go to it. Okay. Now, those were in the days of what we call kitchen software. It means personal computer just came out. So let's go ahead and write code. And we put them on disks and we could sell them. And I had a company doing that. Okay. Uh, for mostly educational purposes and mostly to educational institutions uh, to do this type of analysis. Then came the internet 
And guess what? You needed to be a really big company with a lot of employees to compete. So all of a sudden, Microsoft and others were taking over the software world. And the days of kitchen software were over. Well, they're back. And they're back because I don't need a computer room with a whole lot of servers and air conditioning and uh, lots of employees. Uh, so all we did was say, let's get time through AWS, Amazon Web Services. So we do all our computing and data storage in the cloud. Okay? No setup. We don't need employees. We all work from home. We don't need an office. Okay? And what's really important is in 2017 was the first time I saw a company that was repurposing Morningstar data, which has all these risk dimensions I'm interested in, that I could get through access to their data with API application program interfaces. And so we just use partners, X Ignites one, EOD, Alpha Advantage for the data. And we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So for things like connecting to accounts to get access to account data, we use Yodli, which is owned by UVES, which covers 21,000 financial institutions. And we just pay them right, uh, a fee for access. And there's also an abundance of open source code today, where a lot of the algorithms we use are already out there and we don't have to write them ourselves, but we can just incorporate in our analysis. So here's the implication, a potential for a dominant competitive alternative. And on the spectrum from the high advisory fee, very personalized service, to the middle, which I'll call the robo-advisors, to us at the opposite end of near zero cost to the user, because we view our users as members. Okay? We have a subscription service that we currently price, Ripso Wealth Tools, at $20 a month, not a percentage of assets under management. Our business model is to share the cost of the data, provide the tools for people to do it themselves. And I provide the book as a way to get um, enough investment knowledge to manage your own wealth. So what we're doing is combining current information technology with commercial data access and innovative financial modeling, which I'll show you shortly, in order to provide a platform that can do this. Now, let me take a few minutes to back up what I'm saying. Why is this fee so important and why did it jump out at me? Um, I said to you, I'm looking, I'm thinking about a person that's in their mid thirties with hundred thousand dollars of savings and they're gonna put in 15,000 a year in accounts of savings. So nominally, over time, by the time they're 65, 30 years later, they put in $550,000. Well, how should you invest it? Well, in today's environment, with a bond yield for the whole bond market of 1.6%, if you use index funds, you can get a good fund that we use here, BND, which is an ETF from Vanguard. And they only charge 0.035%. So your net is 1.57%. But if you use an investment advisor who uses active funds, you're going to pay 1.02% is the average for advisor fees and another 66 basis points or 0.66% in expense ratios within the fund. So your total is 1.68. Well, if you're investing the yield and what you're investing is only 1.6 and you're paying costs of 1.68, you're losing 0.08% of your wealth invested in your bond funds. That's 105% of your expected return. So you're losing money. How does an investment advisor look one in the eye and say, I'm acting in your best interests 
but you're going to end up losing money for sure. Okay. So you put in 550,000 and under that scenario, you got 542,000 left. You actually lost money over 30 years. But if you just use bond index fund and use a tool like Ripsaw Wealth Tools, $20 a month, including that, and using um, index funds, you would grow to 725,000. So you've lost 25% of your wealth. Now you wanna combine stocks and bonds. I'll look at the other end for stocks. The average risk premium on stocks is about 8.35%, uh, excuse me, 8.34. And we add another 0.01 for today's riskless rate. So you've got 8.35 as an expected return. Subtract the expense ratio of three basis points or 0.03% for the index funds, and you're down 8.32. Okay. And then with RIPS or Wealth Tools, you would accumulate $3.187 million over 30 years. But if you use an advisor and active funds managers, you'd be down to 2.162 million. You've lost a million dollars and 32% of your wealth accumulation. If you look at it the other way, I could have gone from 2.16 to 3.18 million. That's a gain of 47%. I think this is substantial motivation to learn enough to do this yourself and not use these advisors. And I can tell you our Analytic tools are also going to be better than most advisors. Now, you can use different percentages of stocks and bonds. I give the 40, 60, and the 60, 40 percent case, but either way, it's a compelling uh, an analysis. And then, if you include the fact that most advisors underperform their benchmarks, that's even more important. In terms of the cookie cutter strategies they provide for you and why I call this wealth management. Well, if you look at your coursework and you wanted to take a course, it would probably just say investment management, not wealth management. The reason I talk in terms of wealth management is I want to include all your assets and liabilities in unique family circumstances. So part of your wealth is your home, primary vacation, investment properties. What's your mortgage, auto, student, business, and unsecured loans? What about your wage income, business income, private investments? Uh, later on in life, you'll want to care about social security, pensions, and annuities. Now, this is really important, folks that are older right, and are either anticipating or already have locked in pensions or so going to have social security payments, they're monthly payments. They look just like a bond, okay? Except there isn't a big payment at maturity when you die. In fact, this, the sequence is gone. We call that an interest only security, fixed income. I want to value it. I want to consider it part of my bond portfolio. If I don't, I'm gonna end up overweight bonds and have less allocated to stocks, okay? which means my growth potential will be lower than it should be. When it comes to individual businesses and employee stock options, restricted stock, anytime you wanna make those uh, common stock type strategies, um, for opportunities, look, I, I'm actually in, well invested now in Ripsaw. Right? It's a small company at the moment. Okay? So that means I need less small stock allocation in my liquid stock portfolio. Okay. Let me get back to my original motivation, which was for 30 something dual career families, which all my three children are a part of. And I told you they've given me lots of grandchildren. 
So how complicated is it? Well, they're both working with two 401k plans. They've got two IRAs from previous employment that they've rolled over. They've got 529 plans for the kids and custodial accounts. It's great to shift income to kids in lower tax brackets. So you want to do that and get it started early. They've got joint brokerage account, joint checking account, joint savings account. Oh man, they got 11 accounts. How do I manage the risk dimensions across all those accounts? Well, I need this dashboard, okay? That's gonna show me my aggregate wealth portfolio across all accounts and what each risk dimension is in each account and then see what the aggregate is and compare it to my strategic asset allocation or benchmark strategy. So what did I find when I looked at 401k plans? Okay, now I find that employers, many of them abdicate their responsibility. They hire a firm to provide a 401k. And in that process, the design of the plan likely has limited investment choices that have very high expense ratios. That's good for that company, but not good for you as the investor. Overlapping multiple risk dimensions. They even might have administrative expenses. I saw one that had administrative expense, expense on top of everything else of 0.72%, higher than the yield on their bond funds. And there are always difficulties in rolling over an, to an IRA from a 401k plan. Actually, a first chapter I have in my book is called No Brainers. And I want to use the tax advantage of tax deferred accounts. So I want to maximize that. But I'm also got to be concerned about the quality of it. So the big no brainer is if you leave to a new job, you don't roll over your 401k to the next company's 401k. You don't leave it in place. You roll it over to an individual traditional IRA where you have complete control of the investments. Okay, the orange in these pie charts is underperformance of managers relative to their benchmarks. So you can see this is for US equity, this is for international, this is for uh, bond funds. Uh, some bond funds do a little better like this intermediate investment grade bond fund. Now I can tell you why they do better. Also, it's good to be um, editor of the Journal of Fixed Income to know this and published an article in there that indicates the main source of whatever good performance is in here is not picking undervalued bonds and getting overvalued bonds out of your portfolio. It's what's called sector rotation. So your benchmark might be 47% in treasuries, 26% in corporates, 23% in um, mortgage-backed securities and a smattering of some other sectors. And that treasury sector has been growing over time, as you know, from the fact that we continually run deficits and build up a government debt. So that has to be issued and out there. So what can you do as an investment manager with no great insight or special information? You know that Mortgages and corporates have additional yield or what we call spread over treasuries for the same level of interest rate risk. Now, if you're a long-term investor, over time, you learn that spread. You have intermediate risk in the meantime in short-term circumstances. So what do they do? They underweight treasuries. Let's take 20, 30, 40% out and put it in corporates and mortgages. And on average, I'll beat the benchmark. That doesn't take any special information. You can do that yourself. So I'll show you here with our product how easy it is to just say, you know, instead of investing in the whole bond market, 
I'm going to invest in the sectors of the bond market. If I keep the percentages the same as the belt, as the benchmark, I can match it. Or I can say, you know, I want to be 10% overweight in corporates and 10% overweight in mortgages, and that'll leave me 20% underweight in treasuries. And as long as I've got 30 years to go or something, I no problem. I'm going to beat that benchmark. And I can add value to my portfolio decision. No special information. Okay. So what's the implication? Certainly, do-it-yourself investors should use low-cost index funds on their own. Index funds have been around for 40 years or so. And finally, as I said, they've exceeded active management. But you still have a problem. Even if you use index funds, you still need to know how to construct a portfolio of index funds. So you need an independent, user-friendly, disciplined investment process platform for portfolio construction and then monitoring it make, and make revisions. Okay? And over time, you can have decisions like, oh, my next bonus check, where do I put it? Okay. Oh, I want to buy a house. I need a down payment. What thing should I sell to get my down payment? And what should be the structure of my portfolio after that? Okay. So to automate the process, we need read-only auto-updated account data. So I want to get to all your accounts. Then we want risk information on each investment in each account. And then we need some financial modeling tools to say, oh, maybe I'm missing some potential investments that ought to be in my portfolio. And if I want to invest in Tesla or Apple or something else where, that I believe is undervalued, if I do it in a disciplined way, yeah, I can commit three, four, five percent, ten percent of my portfolio to an active strategy, but I want to control that risk. Okay, I want to do that and work around it to get to as close as I can to my benchmark risk dimension. So what we have in investment management is unlike thinking about, gee, did I make money or lose money? Is zero the right benchmark? Not really, okay. If I have an alternative that's a well-diversified benchmark strategic asset allocation, and if I deviate from that, that's where I'm taking risk. And what's my compensation for taking that risk? That's the way we want to think. And Ripsaw Wealth Tools is independent, meaning we have no intention of ever being an investment advisor, no intention of selling any personal data, and no intention of pushing any specific investments. We want to put people in control of their decisions. And for me, a big deal is wanting to provide more financial education. I firmly believe that financial literacy is a life skill. I wish it started more in middle school and high school, but at some point you need to acquire enough skills to manage your standard of living over your lifetime. Now, the textbook approach to portfolio management, this is probably the largest selling investment textbook by Bodie Kane and Marcus. And this graphic flow chart is in the last chapter. It's something the CFA, Chartered Financial Analyst Institute, promotes. Okay. And what it's doing is saying, gee, what is the whole process look like? Now, when I taught investment management, I instead of the last chapter, I put this at the in the first lecture. Said, what is the motivation for learning all these individual chapters and how does it all fit together? Well, the upper left here is your investor inputs. That is, you got to specify what your investment objectives are, constraints and preferences. And then what are the appropriate portfolio policies and strategies that you could obtain? On the lower left, gee, 
what is my investment opportunity set? How do I characterize it? And then I put the individual characteristics on the investment opportunity set using portfolio construction in the form of a portfolio optimizers and security selection methodology, et cetera. And I come up with a strategy. You implement that strategy. And then what's very important is this box on the right is a month later or every month later, you take a look and see, did I obtain my investment objectives? I measure performance and performance attribution. So I can determine whether or not what I expected to happen happened and whether my tools that I was using gave me the results I was expecting. So for a bond manager, duration, which is a measure of interest rate sensitivity, oh, I was trying to match the benchmark or take on a particular level and ex post, gee, I was using too high a measure, okay? I got a more positive or negative outcome than I anticipated due to changes in interest rates. So I need to come back through the process and reevaluate the tools I was using and improve them. There is no perfection in the business. Okay? You're always looking to improve. Okay. Now, also in this textbook, <clears throat> the description of the portfolio selection process is on this graph on the left-hand side. So what we have is we look at every individual security and notice in a textbook and in most of what advisors do, these are securities that are out there in the marketplace actively traded. So in this area here under the curve, there are a lot of little dots representing each individual security. Risk is defined by standard deviation. That's a volatility measure. We also compute a correlation or covariance measure. So we know how securities would combine into portfolios. The left hand side Y axis here is expected return. Gee, what are we gonna use for that? Uh, past data may not be well indicative, so maybe we'll use one of the asset pricing models that are out there. And uh, nowadays there are over 600 versions of those. Uh, gee, do you have the right one? And then let's add into that some what we call alpha for uh, performance, that is how, by how much is the security undervalued or overvalued, negative alpha. So what you do is you say, you, let's use some math and an algorithm. And for every level of risk, like 20 standard deviation, I'm gonna max find this combination of securities that maximizes expected return. So I could get point E here on the curve. Because I'm not interested in anything uh, down here that has the same amount of risk with less expected return. Or I could take the approach of for each level of expected return, let's minimize risk to hit that curve, okay? So eventually I have the curve from D through P through E that gives me for all the risky assets there, stocks and bonds, what is my best set of opportunities? Then we add a riskless asset, which is usually treasury bills and Say so combinations of that in any risky portfolio will flow will fall below this blue line, which is the tangency point with optimal portfolio P and treasury bills. Then based on your risk preference, this is sort of a, I'll call this a balanced set of objectives, uh, C, which has a certain amount in I got there, I solved for that portfolio by getting to my highest indifference curve. And indifference curve is combinations of expected return and standard deviation that have the same level of utility. So there's really a map of them and you wanna to get to the highest available and that'll be on a tangency point here, okay? Now, if you're more risk averse, you'd have a point below C, okay? which would have more in treasury bills and less in portfolio P. If you wanna get aggressive, you can 
get above C, or you could even borrow, invest the proceeds with your initial investment in P and get to further points out here. In any case, this is the individual against their opportunity set. And for the moment, let's think of this as an opportunity set that has no special information. Um, and this is where the cookie cutter idea came from. That portfolio C has a percentage of stocks and bonds, 44, 29, 25% in T-bills. And the stock portfolio is as large as possible, value weighted of all stocks in the world, the bond portfolio, all bonds in the world. Okay. And it's all I have to do as being an investment advisory firm is put you in a bucket. This might be my growth bucket, okay? at almost 45% stocks. A person that wants to be more income oriented, more conservative, and might have 25% stocks and the rest in bonds and people. So I only have to offer four or five buckets, put everybody that fits in those buckets in the same strategy. But notice there's no performance measurement here. This, what they're giving you is the strategic allocation. And you very rarely see in statements any indication of, did I achieve for you my performance goals? Well, I took a look at this basically after spending time in uh, institutional investment management where you achieve mandates. So I might be up at a large um, pension fund and competing for a mandate to manage some of their fixed income money. And they will tell me, they make the decision how much in stocks and bonds the plan sponsor does. But then within their bond portfolio, they might have $20 billion to allocate among bond managers. So they'll give out, we could get a billion or so, and that's great uh, if we're one of the top managers that they select. And they'll give us a, a benchmark mandate that says, here's the percentage that you need to be in corporates, mortgages, and treasuries. Uh, now you can deviate from that, okay? But if you don't, you better beat that benchmark, okay? Because um, that's the way we're going to determine, A, whether we're going to keep you, and B, how much we're going to pay you uh, based on performance. Okay. So I was in that world, and I said, well, what if I put that world into an individual's set of decision-making? I don't need to build this model. Okay? I've built those before, and I know how assumption-dependent they are. Okay? So I want a world that's easier to manage. So I'm going to set up portfolios along that blue line okay, that people can choose from. Once I have that, I will have a benchmark. So what I care about is a set of risk dimensions that individuals can understand. Okay? So this expected return and standard deviation world and what are all the assumptions behind it are very hard for individuals to understand. But it's pretty easy to understand in a bond portfolio. If I've got more AAA investments, that's the lowest risk, okay? Then I have triple B or below investment grade, that'll be less risky, okay? Now my benchmark is telling me roughly how much to distribute across triple A, double A, single A, triple B, below investment. If I want to match that, that's what I want to go for. I want that risk dimension, the distribution of credit risk. I want the distribution of maturities in the portfolio to help me with interest rate risk. But if I match the benchmark, I'm getting the benchmark's level of interest rate. For and I want to know my distribution across sectors. I want to know my distribution that's US versus international. I want for stocks, my distribution of 
across industries. I want to know for stocks, what percentage is large, mid, and small cap? What percentage is value, blend, and growth, et cetera? So it turns out for each security I might have, if it was a balanced fund investment, I'd probably have all 56 of these risk exposures. And what I want to know is what risk exposure, let's say I is one, that's cash in our example, is in security J in account K. So I know I can go across all accounts and all securities and down below here, which will end up in my wealth portfolio dashboard, what is the risk what is risk exposure to cash from all of these? How much is in stocks? How much is in bond? How much is in small cap stocks, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And our algorithm, when we get to our optimizer is to minimize. Now you don't have to use this optimizer, but if you do choose to use it, you wanna minimize the deviations from the benchmark, okay? An absolute value of squared gives us that. So if I can find the investment weights to move towards, to be closer to my benchmark strategy across all accounts and all securities and all accounts with one click of a button. And I'll have all the constraints and I'll have a set of constraints to help you with tax decisions and tactical trades, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, um, saying I need to create a personal balance sheet, define a set of investment objectives in the form of a strategic asset allocation. I wanna bring data in and I want to have tools to do this analysis and measures of performance for feedback. Okay, okay. so I just loaded an account that has all the information quickly loaded that I described to you. The nice part is those that are what we call like electronically accessed. The Vanguard accounts, a Charles Schwab account, here's a um, credit card account. These are all created here. You can do this really quickly by picking where your accounts are, what institution, putting in your credentials. And we're just gonna read the account information, nothing else. Okay, we can't do any trades in those accounts. We have no access to that. Now, remember I said there are things that won't be in tradable accounts. We call those manual accounts. And we have lots of examples of how you create them. The first obvious one is real estate. And I'll just show you this one filled out already. It's real easy. You just put in your address. And you can go to Zillow and get a market price. This one's a million three fifty. That's your market value. You can put in your purchase cost, which is your basis for gains or losses. And we actually provide you to put, if you'd like, expenses and other things, except for mortgage expenses. And that we're going to have uh, that will come out separately in a mortgage account. Your home mortgage here is also in. So let's say um, your mortgage started out for a million dollar home at 80% or $800,000. Your loan rate was 4%. That was, you did that in January of 2020, 30 year mortgage. And then we can value that mortgage. Okay? First, we wanna calculate the remaining balance, which is 773. But based on today's current rate for that mortgage, the value is actually 882, but you owe that, okay? So this difference from 773 to 882 is actually, it's over $100,000. And it represents the additional cost of you not exercising your prepayment option of paying 4% versus 2.887%, more than a percent less, okay? So that's a valuable tool. I've got my favorite car in here and some restricted stock and a pension fund. So John's pension fund, he worked for the government for a while. So he has a government pension fund. 
that even though he can have another job, but in the meantime, he will get $2,000 for life okay, a month. Okay. Put in his birth date, he's a male, so you go to the mortality tables and he has an expected re remaining life of 17.92 years. The duration match treasury rate is 1.95, so we can discount that cash flow, take its present value, and it's effectively an interest-only bond for that's today worth 362,000 and should be part of your bond portfolio. It's AAA rated, it's a government bond for sector distribution and it's US. So now we can include all those other assets in our portfolio decision-making. We also have is, he's now currently working for US Steel and has some restricted stock worth 26,000. We can go through that too. Notice your balance sheet has a net worth of 2.958 million, but in the in our market value net worth calculation, it's less, 2.849. It's around 100,000 or so, and that's exactly the difference uh, associated with being able to prepay your mortgage. Also, notice in this dashboard, gee. Why is bonds <laughs> negative $254,000? That's because your short position in bonds of 882 is greater than your long positions in your investment portfolio. So you're net negative. Um, we have a little button here that abstracts from your real assets and associated liabilities. Your bond portfolio is 628,000 positive, but your, um, your mortgage valuation is 882, which is larger, so you're net negative. That's important because in interest rate risk management, if you've got a long bond position like this and interest rates go up, you lose money. But if you're short, you gain money. And in fact, you're net short here, which is, good in today's environment. All right, so this is the aggregation and we have different information sources. So this is what I call the descriptive part. And we also have performance data. How is your portfolio doing relative to the benchmark? I wonder why this portfolio is doing so badly. Oh, Tesla's down 4.25% today, lost $13,000. Gee, maybe I'm too overweight in Tesla stock. We can look at that. And we can look at the components of the benchmark and how are they doing. So it looks like the stock market's down, the bond market's down. Could be a rough day today. In fact, we have market information up here on stocks, bonds, volatility measures, Oops, I better go further. Okay, so here's bond yields, how they're changing, and some funds that are primarily bond index funds to give you an idea of how that translates. Okay, um, how about individual securities? Well, if I go into account mode and I open up these accounts, we have loaded, this is all the data we're getting really from your uh, accounts. But then over here, we've got data from this point on that has to do with uh, where we get from other sources. So we know the percentage of cash bonds and stocks for each investment. And we can roll up all the cash investments, the percentage times the value. And we can roll it up to know that we've got 650,000 in cash in aggregate. We can add up all the bond investments for 628, all the stock investments for a million 26. We set our benchmark weights over here, but we can control them. There are two important components. One is what are the underlying securities? We want to use not indexes, but tradable benchmarks that are actually managed. And here we have our US centric default benchmark where we use a money market fund for cash. BND is an ETF by Vanguard that 
mimics, attempts to mimic the total U.S. investment grade market. And VTI, the total U.S. stock market, VXUS, the total international non-U.S. market. I like an 80-20 relationship here. Uh, and I call that U.S. centric because there's a lot of other risks in international investing uh, from things like uh, uh, exchange rate risk, there's uh, accounting risk and the way other countries uh, provide information. Uh, there's geopolitical risk, nationalization, et cetera. If you wanted to go global centric, which a lot of folks do, here's another alternative. We're using more international bonds, 45%. And VT is a global index fund of stocks. And so that includes the whole world. And there, the US is in the range of 50%, while in the US centric benchmark, I like to use 80%. Your choice. You can even use these little plus signs here and add additional uh, sectors. In bonds, you might want to add high yield and put a percentage on it. Once you have those of your alternatives, your next choice is how much to be in stocks, bonds, and cash okay? to reflect your investment objectives and your risk tolerance. We use a simple rule of thumb here as default which I say, I don't like rule of thumbs. This is your, just your first look at it. And your first look is to say, well, if you're 60 years old, there's something called 100 minus your age, which is a John Bogle uh, rule of thumb, which is really saying the older you get, the less risk you want to take because you don't have enough time to recover. So you're reducing your stock weight. So this person's 60.18. So uh, 39.82 is a stock investment. We set up the minimum cash amount because uh, I like to think of bonds and cash as just fixed income, but the remainder goes into bonds. Now, let's say you like to be a little more aggressive. You don't have many obligations. You expect a 30-year retirement. Okay, let's just go up to 50%. And in today's interest rate risk environment, I'd like to be uh, at least 3% in cash. And the remainder is in bonds. I think I said earlier, I don't like target date funds because you should be doing that strategy on your whole portfolio. And here you have an option to do it. So you can pick an allocation in the future to be targeted to. From here, it could be 30%. And and then uh, how you wanna real allocate between cash and, and, and bonds. And what do you wanna do in the reallocation in terms of frequency between annual, semi-annual, quarterly, monthly, et cetera. So you can implement that. I'm not gonna do it here, but remember you don't wanna do a target date fund for a mere 2% of your whole portfolio. If you believe in it, you wanna do it for your whole portfolio. Click on save, close it, and there are the benchmarks. Yellow is 50% stock, 47% bonds, 3% cash as we set it up. Now we can compare your bond strategy to what is uh, your objective. Right? And you see way underweight bonds, way overweight cash, and a little underweight on uh, stocks. Um, we can go through, now we don't want to consider, I could meet my benchmark with one stock, one bond and cash, uh, but that would be a poorly diversified portfolio. So we care a lot about the sub portfolios. So we've got information on stock details that'll tell us both at the individual security level, as well as in my benchmark. What percentage is U.S. versus non-U.S. emerging markets, large, mid, small cap, value blend growth, and sector decisions? Yeah. I do it on time. Um, and we also have bond details as well. And the next thing to think about is, gee, how do I get closer? I'm going to put this back in descriptive mode. I want to get closer to my 
optimal allocation. So how should I do revisions? So we have something called revision mode and the left of this vertical blue bar in this area is our revision section. So anything you would like to change, you can, and you could see the results. Notice what's going on up here, cash, bonds, and stocks, but I have three lines now, your current portfolio, your revised portfolio, and what your benchmark is. So as I make changes, the revised row is going to change, and the what we're going to measure in terms of deviations will be uh, in the form of the revised section. So just as a simple example, let's say I got a lot of cash here. I know I'm overweight cash. And so, gee, I want to sell it. I could just say, let me sell 100,000. Dan, you have about five minutes. Okay, good. And then I will, let's say I want to um, buy more stock. I can put that 100,000 in the S&P 500. And you will see that, oh, that's 10,000, sorry. Okay. You'll see that my stock allocation increased 100,000 and my cash dropped by 100,000. And all those 56 risk dimensions have changed. Now that's kind of a long way to do it because we have something called the Ripsaw Optimizer that has your current deviations in it and we'll try and minimize them across all your securities. So it moved in the right direction. It reduced your deviations by 34.56% here. Okay. But gee, I just don't have, you can see I don't have much in bond funds here. So you know that's a problem. I'm still way underweight bonds. So we have an assist program that goes in, analyzes your portfolio, and we have an advanced screener that says, okay, I'm underweight bonds. So gee, let me pick BND. Let me put it in my tax deferred accounts, which is preferred. And we optimize and I go to 80% reduction. And you can see the big investment in BND and Jane's IRA and also in John's IRA. Okay. But gee, I'm still far away. Oh, it wants me to add agencies and corporates. Why does it want me to do that? Well, I have 326,000 in a pension that's all US government. I'm trying, BND gives me that nice ratio of corporates, mortgages, and governments, but BND, I mean, uh, the pension fund doesn't, so I need to add those. If I add mortgages, my screener gives me some good options. I can take it, add it to the portfolio, put it in accounts that are tax efficient, and it'll get me from 80% to 82% roughly. Let's look at corporates. Now, the algorithm's smart enough to say, you know, I want to manage maturity structure as well, so I'm just going to provide short and intermediate term corporate bonds and not, excuse me, short and long term and not intermediate term because I'm probably overweight there. So I'm gonna take these two and put it in these accounts and re-optimize and see I'm going from 81.9 to 90.9%. Now I'll never get to 100, but just take a look at all the green. Okay, I'm very close in my cash bond and stock allocation. I'm very close in a lot of the subsectors. What are my credit ratings? And maturity structure, I think, is going to be still overweight because I've got that pension fund. Notice all that's nice. Okay, so that's pretty good. Okay, I could stop here, but. You know what? John still thinks, look what it did. Naturally sold most of Apple, 200,000 worth, most of Tesla, 291,000 worth because of the inefficiency okay? uh, and the lack of diversification. But, you know, I still want some. 
because I still think it's undervalued. So let me put 100,000 in Tesla and put a constraint to hold that. And same thing, I'm gonna do that with Apple too. All right, Stan, we're on a route, route right out of time. So okay. let's make this the last point. Okay, oh, mind. I have to put a hold on that too. And I'm gonna say, now notice I'm at 90.9%. I'm going to drop to 83%, but I'm viewing that, and that's going to cause me, as you can see, consumer cyclicals overweight and um, overweight in growth because we've got, we're investing in large cap growth stocks. So large cap should also be overweight. Yes, it is, not terribly. All right. So it's working around in a disciplined fashion, how much I want to take in a tactical strategy versus how not without giving up a lot of diversification. So anybody could run this, not too hard. Well, thank you. Let's, let's give uh, Stan a, a, a nice applause. And also if you have questions, you're welcome to stay after class and ask them of him, okay? So thank you very much for such an interesting product. I think we learned a lot about how technology can help us be better at portfolio management. So we'll, we'll stay on unmute and go ahead and ask if you have a question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Any questions? Professor, I just uh, have a question about office yeah. hours. Are you going to be in office hours from two to three today? I'll be, yeah, I'll be yeah. there. Uh -huh. okay. Awesome. Okay. Sure. I won't. All right. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. Appreciate okay. it. My pleasure. Bye. bye. Thanks, Definitely. Dan. This is awesome. You're great. Okay. So interesting. It just you know really sets up our fintech about how much you know other tools, big data, and that so forth can. Uh, Get in the way of the established wealth management profession. So it's, it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. When I get when I get through this semester, I said I got I got to put some eyes on this because I you know we're heading toward retirement and I have not, I'm just not I just don't have any time. So, yep. but you watch for me. I will. I will. All right, Stan. Thanks again. Hope you'll sure. do it again. Hope you'll come back. Okay, my pleasure.